We are living in perilous times, precarious in every possible way. Not only are people untrusting about those serving in the highest echelons. Did you ever think you'd ever live in a period of time when the FBI and the DOJ, the highest in the protective mechanism and the, the supposed to be the most loyal and, uh, and, you know, steadfast and whatever you want to say. And I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it's leading to a possibility that somebody in a very high place, high echelon of one of those areas I mentioned, could be charged with malfeasance in office and could even go to jail. I never thought we'd ever live in a time like that. But not only in that area of the country, but society at large. Relationships with rogue nations. I mean, there hardly is a newscast that goes by that you don't hear something about Iran and North Korea. And it's important you link those two together because they help each other in developing the nuclear missiles and the nuclear possibility that extends into the future. Rogue nations, because they don't fit in line with the, the peaceful nations of the world. And rogue, and we, we need to pray for Iran because there are people in the streets. Do you know that 50% of Iranians are under 30 years old? It's a very young, young, a lot of young people in that country. And they've been out in the street prote protesting and well, more than a couple of dozen have been shot to death because they, were, they just want freedom. In fact, if you understand the Muslim world, the women are so determined, so desperate, they're taking off their borkas and they're taking off their headdress and walking in the streets in protest of what the uh, Khomeini and the rest have done. So, I mean, terrorism, everywhere you turn, all kinds of disasters, hurricanes, flooding, eruptions of volcanoes and train wrecks. I mean, you hear of occasional train wreck. We have now a whole slew of train wrecks. Another one happened since the GOP was on one train. You know that happened, hit a, some kind of a dump truck or something. But all kinds of things that shake up the whole nation. It causes fear and chaos at home and abroad. So while we're satiated with this nefarious and uncertain news, yet juxtaposed to that, the good news that God is judiciously building a sure house, which is to be a place of refuge from the storm. Can you say amen? <clears throat> You'd have to be an old timer. In the old Church of God, or old Assemblies of God, or Fourth Square, or whatever, and the way early rain, early and latter rain. <laughs> Remember that song. It says, well, "How is that when the storms of life?" You see these what tough people to stand on. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. <laughs> Hallelujah! I can't sing worth a lick, but I'll tell you one thing. <laughs> I feel that thing. Hallelujah. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. Oh, I wish I knew. I don't know the other the rest of it. I'd sing this. It came to me in the night. Another song came to Sister Merlene. I said, honey, what's on your mind? She gave it. And I said, and I, oh, my Lord. She said, I remember my grandfather, she said, singing that. You know, you just stand real nice and tall. You just have to, you have to stand and do the part, if you know what I mean. But God has an auspicious and glorious purpose which he intends to accomplish, and it's through the refulgent incubator where people are born and matured and grow up to be strong saints of the living God, ready to serve. Thank you. Ready to serve. Praise God. If the body of Christ is going to demonstrate the glory of God to the nations, it's imperative and vital that every member of the body of Christ be in his or her place of function and takes his or her respective responsibility seriously. Yeah. Times of 
lightheartedness and just barely, you know, being a little religious is gone. It's time to dig down deep and stand firm upon your faith. And know that God is never going to leave us nor forsake us. And how knoweth that we have come to the kingdom for such an hour as this? Could be us, praise God. Why not us? Why not now? Seems to me Martin Luther King said that. Praise his name. So we need to come. So God's purpose, or what shall I say, his glorious purpose for his body, that's the church, and his dynamic plan for its construction is evident in the Word of God. His tremendous concern is for the active involvement of every member of the ministry that God has called them to. God has called all of us. It may be just your neighbor. Sister Merlene one day was praying to God, said, Lord, I want to be used of God. And she was praying that God would help her to, to see it. And so, so somebody come knocking at the door. And it's the junk man. This big truck picking up all the trash that where we went at that particular time. And she started to go out the door and she she thought a moment and God said, Here he is. <laughs> and she went out and witnessed to him and my Lord before he left, he, I think he was about to have himself a benefit because she really she really laid it in on him. First Peter chapter two, verses ten, I love this. I know you'll love it too. Who once were not a people. If you don't know that, you don't know anything. Before you knew Jesus, I don't care how elevated you were in the eyes of others, how much many degrees you had earned, how prominent you were in the business community or elsewhere. Before you knew him, this applies to you. Who once were not a people, but now the people of God. You weren't, but now. How don't you like it? Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Praise it be to God. Not a people, but now we are a people. Turn to your neighbor and say, I think we're somebody. Turn to the other person and say, I think we're somebody going somewhere. We're on our way somewhere. God's refulgent incubator. I just love it. It's a place where God's people can grow up. It's God's habitation. That's his abode. God lives in here. He's here attending this service today. Hallelujah. Not in person. I know where he is in person. Because he's omnipresent, he's here. Hallelujah. Sitting right next to you, perhaps. So behave. Watch yourself. Don't be getting that chewing gum out and try to distract yourself from the Word of God here. Well, yeah, you can chew gum in church. I just thought I'd stick that in or sound funny to me. Now, when you think about it, God has given to man visual pictures by which he can better communicate, and he can communicate his mind to man. We have seen God give man a picture of the church, saying that it was made up of peculiar people. Now, the world takes that different, of course. They think we're a bunch of oddities, happenstances, something the cat drug in overnight can't behave ourselves, emotional, maybe some deplorables in the crowd, I don't know for sure. <laughs> Sorry, I, did, I, I just got, I lost control of myself there for a moment. But let's look at some scripture. I love First Peter 2 because it, I like that, I love the church. I mean, if, if, I, if I go overboard on it, uh, I'm not even going to ask you to forgive me. Just indulge me, just indulge me. Now let's, I want you to see this. When you read this with me, you're going to see what I mean. You also, (laughs) you also, (laughs) you would have never thought it, but you also. Come on, read with me. As living stones are built up a spiritual house, look what what we are, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture... Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, watch it, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. 
and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you. Turn to your neighbor and say, but you. Oh, you're not cooperating today. Tell somebody, but you. Now read it with me. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Oh, hallelujah. A holy nation. His own special people. Yeah, we think we're somebody. And we are somebody. Bless the name of the living God. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Are you listening? Who once were not a people, but now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty. Give him a shout. We're a conglomeration. Now, don't take it negatively. A conglomeration just seems to mean that we're kind of meshed together in that sense. Individuals that are meshed together in one, we are one in Christ. Blessed be his holy name. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are, I'm, I'm talking about you today. I wish you could appreciate it. You say, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to think about life. I just don't feel good. And the worst is yet to come. No, I'm trying to build you up today, not just by being a raw, raw cheerleader up here. I'm trying to give you the word. For we are, we are. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, we are. we are. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Wow. Look at this in the Amplified Version of the Bible. It says, you are God's garden and vineyard and field under cultivation. You are God's building. Another translation says that we are God's tilled soil. He's tilling the soil. That's why sometimes you feel a little uncomfortable. Why does he have to put his finger on that so hard? Why does he have to pick on me? He, what's he been doing? Listening, reading my Facebook? No, I don't get on your Facebook. I don't care nothing about your Facebook. What's he know? Has he heard something from somebody? Why is he picking on me? Well, maybe you need picked on. You little smarty pie. Yeah. <laughs> just receive the word. <laughs> oh, you know I love you. I just like to chastise you a little bit once in a while. Let's go to Psalm 149, verse 1. The word of God is great. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. And his praise in the assembly of the saints. Don't you love it? First Timothy 3.15. A lot of good words here. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Is the church a place to spread gossip and put somebody down? Avoid somebody? Treat somebody badly? Oh, my. 1 Timothy 3.15. I felt that, Lord. Hurt, too, a little bit right there. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 12. Saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. Say, so why do you sing so much? No kidding. One time, and I'm not putting Lutherans down. I love Lutheran people. They're fine. Every once in a while, you know, pastor's not, he's not in his pulpit or he's in between churches. And, and they'll stop in, you know, from different denominations. And this Lutheran pastor, he stopped in and, and he was enjoying it. He hadn't heard the word of God so strong like I was preaching. And, and, but he was, but one day he said, Brother Dave, I've enjoyed your church. But he said, it's like calisthenics in your church. Up and down, up and down down, singing and shouting, and up and down. He said, can't we just get up once and sit down and stay down? He said, just like the old lady was filled with the Holy Ghost, said, sit down, I can't sit down. I said, sit down, I can't sit down. I got the Holy Ghost and I can't sit down. <laughs> oh, I don't know where I'm going today. We are the congregation of the saints. Can you say praise God? Praise Let's go to Ephesians again, 21 and 22. I'm borrowing some of the verses that the doctor used in the first, first game. 
in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Oh, we're one. Do you understand that? We're being... God is fitting us together. He's mortaring us together. He's placing us together so that we can know that together we can defeat anybody. The synergy of being together exceeds anything man can calculate in his brain. If one could put a thousand to flight and two could put ten thousand, could you imagine what a thousand people could do? You remember how, how could, could you imagine how many demons we could put to flight? But you know, when you look about the relationship, we just talked about how we're his garden where he's planting seeds in us and we're growing in the incubator as it were. Did you notice how God wants a warm fellowship? Did you notice in the garden how warm the fellowship was between Adam and Eve and God? God, the creator of the heavens and earth, busy, busy, busy. But in the cool of the day, we'd come and meet with Adam and Eve. And they'd hang out together, talk over things, share things. But when, and all God wanted from Adam and Eve was that warm relationship. And that's all he wants from us. But God will not force it. When Adam and Eve, by effort of their own will, because they were free-willed people, they, were, they had a free moral agency, when they decided on their own to sin against God and disobey him, egregiously. He had to kick them out of the garden. I've explained it many times. But all God has tried to do since then is let people know how bad that sin was. To kick God, kick sand in the eyes of God and shun him and walk away from him and, and disobey him. He wanted them to know how important it was for that relationship that was disenfranchised because of what man, what man sin caused. And all he wanted to do is find people who wants him. Who wants someone who doesn't want you? My Lord, every spouse here wants to know they're wanted for sure. And when the, where it comes a time in many relationships where that no longer is the case, that's when divorce happens. 50% of all marriages wind up in divorce. Oh my, we should be so proud of ourselves. We've become so liberal and so, so free. But that's the case when people lose that need for each other and compassion for each other, then they can grow apart. What's well, the same thing with God? When Adam and Eve had their relationship with God in the garden, it was warm. It was what God was because they wanted. They, could, they were anxious to meet him every day. And they, they would talk about what they did and the fish they named and all the different things that went on. But after they sinned, God wanted them to know how bad it was that they did that because they became estranged from him. And that's what we're in the process of doing in this incubator. This whole refulgent incubator, we're at, the, we're at the business of teaching people that God wants you to want him. Even our president says, we want people, and I know you may disagree, and that's okay. Just let me sometime quote that poor guy. He's president of the United States. <laughs> I shouldn't have to defend him. I shouldn't have to defend him. But he says, we would like to have people come to the United States of America that would learn our language and love our country and want to be here. Not come to our country, then get in the street and start placard with their placards. Well, anyhow, that's what he said. I don't, I don't take any credit for it. But anyhow, God's looking for a warm relationship. Well, what I'm just saying there, we'd like to have people come in. All of us perhaps come from immigrants of some sort. I'm only, I'm first generation American. My parents came from Italy. But I can tell you one thing. I was raised in a home where I was taught I was American. I don't know. I was a little kid. I always wanted to learn some Italian words. I say, Dad, how do you say fork in Italian? How do you say dish or whatever? Just trying to learn a little something. He'd look me in the eye and say, You're American. Speak English. Now, don't don't take that to be detrimental. I mean, that, but I'm just saying, some of the early immigrants learned. They came to America. They were happy to be here. And they wanted to be here. And they want to contribute to it. Okay, now, I knew, we got, I knew I'd get a little political if I did that. Well, and while I'm at that about the president, let me tell you another thing about him. 
the president has had the unmitigated nerve to say that we're moving our embassy to Jerusalem. <laughs> and those of us who are lovers of Israel because God chose Israel as his own chosen people, we're thrilled as all get out. And when he was meeting with Netanyahu just the other day, he said, and we've told our people who are in charge of this, speed it up. Don't wait years and years. Speed it up. It's true, a lot of people walked out of the meeting in the United Nations when it came up. But you know that five other nations said, bless God, we're going to build our embassy in Jerusalem also. Well, I don't know if you know what that really means. It's, you know, it's other presidents have talked about doing it. Now, if we get this done and we go and do that, all we're doing is validating that Jerusalem legitimately is the capital of Israel. And let me tell you something else. It's an important place. Uh, let me go to a script. Let's go to Revelation 21. I don't know how much time I have here, but I want to do this. 21, 1 through 3. I want you to look at this. <clears throat> because this has to do with what I just said. And now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. But there was also no more sea. Think about that. Let's see, that, uh, go on, I want to get, then I, John, saw the holy city, now watch this, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them, and be their God, and the new Jerusalem physical Jerusalem. You say, why is it taking so long? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. I have to go. I'm going to send you another comfort. I've got to, got to go to prepare a place. There must be billions of people going to be a part of that. Hallelujah. It's taking a little time. It takes time to build the biggest state and mansions. You want a shack on the side of a railroad track, you'll have to go someplace else. <laughs> He's about the business of building some pretty mighty places up there. Hallelujah. But imagine that new Jerusalem is one day when the time comes is going to come down from heaven and position itself right beside the Jerusalem that's physically here now. The difference is we are going to live in there. Now, I don't know if you appreciate the beauty of this place that's being prepared by Jesus himself, but there's not going to be any night there. And there won't be any need of the sun because he's going to be the law. Oh, I don't, think, I don't think you're getting it today. I'm talking about a place that he has made that's going to come down to earth. And we who are born again, blood washed, blood washed ready, to go, ready to go up, are going to live in that city. And we're going to serve as kings and priests forever. And there's no devil or, or any imp that's hatched out of hell that can stop us from doing what he said we're going to do. I said we're going to do it. Can you say amen? amen. Well, I'm going to have to skip a whole lot there. But I'm going to go on to then my next finishing point. <laughs> Hallelujah. You. I'm not talking about your grandma. If she's here, I'm talking to her. You are a part of the royal family. God picked you, appointed you, anointed you, mandated you, and trust you. He placed in you the, the desire to be a part of his army, army. He credentialed you, relying on you, happy with you. Come on. Stop hanging down your head, Tom Dooley. Walking through you, using you, depending on you, expecting good to come from you, and because of you, winning with you, rejoicing with you, shouting with you, walking with you. I'm talking about the Christ of Calvary, the one who created heaven and earth. Why don't you give him a shout? Yeah. 